Thanks very much, Anthony. I think I should first of all say thank you to you because you thanked everybody else and uh, we're very grateful to you for your leadership role and it's a great pleasure for me from UMIA Centre for Global Health Research to um, co-host this with, uh, with, with your centre. It's been a, a very good experience and I hope will be repeated in the future. It's also a massive um, pleasure to me to be able to introduce Dr. Kasseti Brown, the uh, Minister of Health from Ethiopia. Since he took on the post of Minister of Health in 2012, he's become a good friend and colleague, and uh, I have quite a lot of contact with him, but uh, he's doing a great job. In introducing him, I don't want to just repeat what it says in the bio, because you can read that anyway. I just want to contextualize what he's going to, or what I think he might say at least, um, a, a, a little bit. Um, Ethiopia is a huge country, 50% bigger population than the UK, five times the land area of the UK, and so providing health care on that scale is a massive, massive responsibility. And the fact that Ethiopia has been recognized by the UN as one of the few sub-Saharan African countries to already have achieved the child survival goal, the MDG4 goal, various other good things going on. The annual graduation of medical doctors has risen from 200 per year to 3,000 per year in the last few years, which is an amazing achievement um, for, a, for a country. Um, so you get the picture, I hope, that this is really a country on the move in, in terms of, of health. Ethiopia has tended to appoint young, clever public health professionals as ministers of health, and I think that um, what we're seeing now is clearly the dividend of having done that. So right from the top leadership, right down to, even down to the community health worker level, of which there are now some 38,000, I think, in the country. So it's a huge pyramid from uh, Gassetti at the top down to those 38,000 community health workers. But we invited you here particularly because you know, people like me who sit around in universities can have all kinds of bright ideas about we could have an app for this or we could use mHealth for that. But what we really wanted to start with in this meeting is to hear what is your perspective on this whole M Health as a as a policy maker, as a leader of one of the world's major health services? What really is the situation from an Ethiopian perspective, from an Af from an African perspective? What might be needed in the future? Where should we be thinking? So we're looking to you for for guidance. You're very welcome, Cassetti. Thank you so much for accepting to come and give our keynote. Thank you, Peter, for the kind introduction. And thank you, Anthony, and uh, our UCL colleagues and the organizers for uh, inviting me to deliver a keynote at this important meeting. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce you my country, Ethiopia. As uh, Peter said, Ethiopia is the second most populous country in Africa, next to Nigeria. We have a population of uh, 90 million plus. Uh, we will probably surpass the 100 million mark uh, in a little more than two years. Uh, every year, three million babies are born in Ethiopia. So you could uh, basically say that we create a West African country every year. <laughs> Ethiopia is located in East Africa. Uh, it is one of the oldest civilizations in the world, with more than 3,000 years of uh, history. If you are interested in, in uh, history, Ethiopia is a country to visit. Uh, you see ancient monuments, churches, uh, paintings, and so on. Um, if you like geography, Ethiopia is also a country to visit because we have the lowest point on Earth, the Danakil Depression, with uh, 200 meters below sea level, 
And we have also the highest, one of the highest points in Africa. In fact, Ethiopia is referred as the Tower of Africa because we have lots of mountains. It is also the origin of the Nile. Uh, we contribute more than 85% of uh, the water uh, to the Nile. If you are into religion, Ethiopia is also the place to visit because uh, you, know, you see Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In fact, uh, outside of the Middle East, it is only Ethiopia that is mentioned in both the Bible and the Holy Quran. So it is, you know, an interesting place uh, to, uh, to, to visit. Over the last 10 years, the country has also registered double-digit economic growth, an average of 10.6% per year. And in fact, we are one of the largest, the fourth largest economy in Africa. Uh, when people hear about Ethiopia, they remember the famines and all the droughts uh, that happened in the 80s. But Ethiopia has really moved on. And we have invested a lot in the development of the country and in the development of our, our people. And we are starting to see the benefit of the investment we have made and the peace and security uh, we have enjoyed over the last two decades. The capital of Ethiopia, Addis, is uh, also the, the diplomatic capital of Africa because it hosts the African Union and it is also a seat of many UN and other multilateral agencies. It is very easy to get in and out of Ethiopia because of the Ethiopian Airlines uh, which is the largest airline in Africa. So uh, feel free to come, visit us, and see what we, we have been doing. So enough about marketing my country. I hope I have done a good job. Let me come back to, to the health sector. Uh, the health sector in Ethiopia uh, is structured in, in a three-tier system. The first tier is a primary health care unit. By primary health care unit, we mean uh, one hospital, one rural hospital, four to five health centers, and health extension workers or community health extension workers. I will, I will get to that uh, in a moment. Uh, the second level is uh, uh, the secondary level of care, which we call general hospitals. And uh, our standard is one hospital for uh, one million people, and we have 80 uh, general hospitals in the country. And the third level is a tertiary hospital, university hospitals, for uh, one hospital for, for a population of three to, to five uh, million. And we have around 28 uh, tertiary hospitals uh, around the country. Uh, when we, we started revamping the health system, uh, if you look at the health system in Ethiopia, the, the landscape 20 years ago, we had fewer health facilities, around 300 health centers, and 60 hospitals. And most of these health centers and hospitals were concentrated in the big cities uh, in the country. Uh, However, 80% of our population resides in rural areas. So access to health facilities has been a challenge. So we started on a massive expansion of health facilities into the rural areas. And 20 years ago, we had fewer health science colleges, only three medical schools. So it is really a challenge to rely heavily on a health system that is based on doctors and nurses and you know, midwives and so on. So we sort of prioritized what needs to be done. And we decided to introduce a community health workers program, which we call the health extension program. Uh, through this program, we have uh, trained and deployed 38,000 health extension workers. Most of you may know about community health workers uh, program in many parts of the world. 
Uh, we believe that the health extension program in Ethiopia is unique in many ways. The first and important uh, feature of our health extension program is the health extension workers are government salaried. So it's not like volunteers uh, working with a particular project and so on, but our health extension workers are on government payroll and they are regularly paid their salaries. And this makes uh, the program unique. Second, our health extension workers are properly trained. It's not a one week training, two weeks training, or three weeks training, but it is a one year training program. So our health extension workers go through a one year uh, training program uh, and then they are deployed to rural areas where they serve. The third, they are part of the formal health system. So in many parts of the world, community health workers are, you know, these individuals working at the community level. They are not in any way linked with the formal health system. Our health extension workers are an integral part of the, the health system. In fact, we consider them as a pillar of the health system. So what do we mean by when we say they are part of the formal system? They are recognized as health professionals by, by the, the professional councils. They have a clear career ladder. In fact, our vision is the first cohort of the health extension program will be family physicians 20 years down the line. So we have really created a career ladder so that they can identify with the health system and aspire to grow, to grow within uh, the health system. Third, we track what they do. So we have a community health information system that tracks the, the services they provided to the community. So when you see the national uh, health service utilization reports in Ethiopia, that means the contribution of the health extension workers is also attracted. So these uh, unique characteristics make the, the Ethiopian health extension program unique. But apart from this, the philosophy of the program is also unique. We see our health extension workers as agents of social transformation as agents of change. So we in Ethiopia believe that health can be produced. So you can harvest your health if you adhere to healthy behavior, if you utilize basic services. So our health extension workers are not only there to provide services, but they are there to provide a skill and knowledge to communities. Not so long ago, many people in Ethiopia believe that malaria is a curse from God. They don't really, they didn't really know that malaria is transmitted by mosquito. And by modifying the environment and by protecting yourself from mosquito bites, people didn't know that they could prevent malaria. So when we say our health extension workers are agents of change, they give the necessary information, skill, and knowledge to the community so that they can prevent disease and ill health, and they can promote the health and well-being of their family members. So with this concept, we introduced what we call model families. So our health extension workers train families in a very structured manner over a period of three to four months. And when those family members start to adopt and practice what they have learned, they are recognized as model families in the community. In fact, we use the Rogers model of innovation diffusion. So our health extension workers in the early days when they were deployed to their rural communities they identify innovators, they work with them, they train them based on the health extension package. And then when those families start to have their kids vaccinated, and when they construct toilet and use it, when they sleep under mosquito nets, 
And when they improve the hygiene and sanitation of their environment and their personal hygiene, then based on specific criteria, those families are assessed by the supervisors from the district and recognized as model families. And we do it through a, you know, a, a very good ceremony to you know, encourage other members of the community to be part of this uh, model family training program. So over the last 10 years, we have trained so many families and graduated so many families to be model families. Uh, I, will, I will come to this uh, later on. The reason I am giving you this information is when I talk about M Health application in health sector, this will be the starting point to, to scale up intervention using M Health, the model families and the health extension program. So in addition to uh, the training and deployment of our health extension workers, we have now two in every village around the country and we have, they are based in, in a center called Health Post. We have more than 17,000 health posts throughout the country where our health extension workers are based. They, they provide some services at the health post level. They go house to house and provide service at, at the household level. And they also visit primary schools and educate the students working in primary schools. So, our health extension workers you know, operate in three settings, house visits uh, at the health post and in schools. So the second level above the health post or the health extension program is the primary health centers. So while we expanded the training of our health extension workers, we have also at the same time started massive expansion of health centers throughout the country. So 20 years ago, we had 300 health centers. In fact, in 2005, we had only 600 health centers. Today, we have 3,500 health centers. So massive investment has been done to expand the physical <coughs> infrastructure of the health centers. A health center has an average of 14 health workers. Uh, we have what we call health officers, two health officers in every health center. These are like clinical officers in other parts of Africa or junior physicians, if you may. And we have two midwives in every health center. And uh, the remaining are nurses, lab technicians, and pharmacy technicians. So with the massive expansion of the primary health centers, we have also increased our uh, production of these mid-level health workers. And since three years ago, we have also embarked on massive expansion of rural hospitals to improve access to uh, comprehensive emergency obstetric care. In fact, our goal is to have 800 rural hospitals by 2020. And in the last two years alone, we have constructed 185 hospitals. So we believe that the ambition of having 800 hospital could also be achieved over the next few years. We use uh, lots of resources from our development partners. We leverage those resources to mobilize more domestic resources to construct and train health workers so that we build a very strong and resilient health system. Uh, in, in 2008, Ethiopia has undertaken major health sector reform programs based on the six building blocks. And one of the most important reforms we believe will, will, will help the country have a, a very resilient health system is the reform of the health management information system. It is, I, I am probably biased because it is my country and it is one of our initiatives that we have started, but it is, Ethiopia is the only country where we have a full-time health information technician whose full-time job is to do data analysis and use it for decision-making at the lowest level of the system. This is a three-year training program after high school 
so for high school graduates, they have to go through a three-year training program on both health information and ICT. And they are part of, again, the formal health system to, to, to properly analyze data at the lower level of the system. We have around 2,500 of these health information technicians in the country. And our goal is to have 10,000 health information technicians by 2020. So we are training a significant number of them at, at, this, at this moment, and we will also scale up the training of health information technicians. These are also important when we talk about uh, ICT for development, e-health, m-health, and so on, uh, because these will be the ones that will sustain the interventions we are going to introduce using digital uh, platforms. So the plan is to have at least one health information technician at the health center level, at least two at the district health office level, and you know between four and 12 at different levels of hospitals. And their full-time job is not only to collect data and report it to the higher level of the system. We only require 100 something indicators, 120 maximum indicators to be reported to national level. But at the health facility level, lots of data is collected. And in many parts of you know, my country in the past and, and Africa, this rich data is not utilized to improve quality of care, to improve decision making at the lower level of the system. So when we introduce these kind of health cadres, they will be able to analyze the, 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 the health problems in their context and prioritize the interventions and help the program managers and the district health officials to have uh, better orientation in terms of uh, you know, what, what they invest in when it comes to, to health. The second most important reform we did is the introduction of a public health emergency management system. So in Ethiopia, from the national level up to the district level, we have what we call the public health emergency management process. Uh, when we did the reform, we used a business process reengineering tool to, to do the, the, the reform. So it is an end-to-end -end kind of uh, process design from national to district level, and we have a very well aligned public health emergency management system. And there are certain indicators that have to be reported immediately. We have around 23 reportable diseases in Ethiopia. Some of them have to be reported immediately. Some of them, like malaria indicators, on a weekly basis. And this is also another area that could potentially benefit from introduction of mHealth in, in the country. And the third reform we introduced in, in, in 2008 is the expansion of the supply chain management system in Ethiopia. We have one huge central medical store with lots of regional hubs, around 26 regional hubs, that shifted from a push system of pharmaceutical delivery to a pull system. So basically, uh, we, we are designing a door-to-door -door supply of pharmaceutical uh, products to our health facilities. So when we expand our network of health facilities from literally zero health posts to 17,000, and from 600 health posts in 2005 to 3,500 health centers, and from around 120 hospitals to you know, 800 over the next few years, you can imagine the challenge and the stress it is going to put on the supply chain management system. And when you design a door-to-door -door supply system, a pool system, information is going to be very critical. And we believe that mHealth could, could also help on, on, on this. So these are, and many other reforms have been introduced in 2008, but I uh, thought these are you know, the reforms that are directly linked with, with uh, you know, the topic today. So while we have invested all these inputs and uh, you know reengineered our processes and so on, we have also enjoyed you know good outcomes in terms of improving the health indicators. As I stated earlier, Ethiopia has achieved MDG4 three years ahead of the 2015 deadline. We have reduced maternal mortality by around 69%. We believe that we will 
uh, reach the targets uh, at the end of this year. HIV infection has gone down by more than 90 percent. Malaria and TB has been, uh, you know, very well controlled. So our indicators have really improved. And one good indicator that tells you how far the country has gone is the average life expectancy of Ethiopians. 20 years ago, the average life expectancy in Ethiopia was only 45 years. Today, it is 64. And we believe that we will even uh, you know, achieve higher uh, levels of health outcomes uh, to our people, to our, to our uh, compatriots, if all the investments continue uh, to, to be sustained in, in the years to come. So when it comes to M health, we have prioritized certain you know, areas to use technology. Uh, the first one is data exchange. So the health sector has massively expanded. So we really need to know what is going on at the community level, whether the health extension workers are reaching you know, segments of the communities that have never been reached before. So data exchange, we believe, could potentially benefit from, from M Health. The second one is supply chain. So in a massive country like Ethiopia, where infrastructure is not so well developed, you know, considering uh, it with, with the size of the country, getting information about you know, stock status of essential commodities at all levels of the system is important. So we want to use M-Health and E-Health solutions to improve uh, information about supply chain. The third is real-time referral. So patients are seen at the community level by our health extension workers. And if there are you know, complications that has to be uh, notified to the higher level of the system, we want to use you know, technology, M-Health, to alert and notify the higher level of the system. So this is also another area where we wanted to, to use M-Health. The third is consultation. Our health extension workers are based in remote areas, in villages. So they need to use M Health and technology to get proper consultation from their supervisors. By the way, we have one dedicated supervisor for every 10 health extension worker, whose full-time job is to provide supportive supervision. So reaching out to, to these supervisors at zero cost to the health extension workers is, is important. Because when we did a situational analysis some three, four years ago, our health extension workers were using 10% of their time to buy their salary to buy airtime. And most of the time, you know, in a, in a rural village, you use your cell phone in for work-related issues, to get information, to get consultation, and so on. You, you just don't call your friends because they are you know, closer to, to, to you. you. You go and see them. So they use their airtime for work related. So we really want to avail MHealth solutions for proper consultation uh, for the health extension workers. And the last one is training and education. Since we have designed a career ladder for our health extension workers and we are introducing a continuous professional development uh, for, for the health extension workers and the other health workers in the system, we want to use M Health uh, to, to, to provide this. In Africa, as well as in Ethiopia, providing in service training and the refresher trainings is a costly endeavor. You know, we have this new disease in Ethiopia and in Africa, I, I think I read it in one of the international journals called Perdiamitis. Uh -huh. There is this need for pardiums. So people really want to move and attend conferences everywhere. So the idea of giving in-service trainings has lost its meaning. So we believe that M Health and digital solutions will also provide these kind of solutions to health workers 
who really need to refresh their knowledge and their skills. What has happened in Ethiopia over the years? In Ethiopia and in many parts of Africa, and I believe uh, other parts of the world, since mHealth is a new technology, a new solution, there has been lots of pilots, lots of pilots that hasn't really taken off. So when we talk about mHealth, we really need to think about forging strong partnership with the local governments, with academia in country, and forging partnership may not be sufficient, but we have to do things with a view of scaling up. So without a view of scaling up, if you, you know, present me a beautiful pilot project with no money to scale up, with no long-term plan to, to, to implement it at scale, what good does it, does it do to me? You know, all pilot projects can demonstrate successful results because you invest a lot of money and you want it to succeed so that you know, there is lots of support and so on. When you take that at scale, you know, that kind of support will not be there. So there is no guarantee for policy makers that there will be good return on the investment. So when we, we start piloting, we really need to think about partnership. We need to think about you know, the, the, the source for the money to scale up. And we have to also pilot it with a view of scaling up. The, the other important message I have is choosing the appropriate technology. So countries are unique in terms of language diversity, in terms of you know, the literacy rates, in terms of you know, uh, access to uh, you know, smartphones and so on. In Ethiopia, we have around 33 million mobile subscribers. And most of the mo mobile subscribers, including our health extension workers, use basic phones, not the, the smartphones. So when you think about implementing mHealth, you have to really understand the, 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 the appropriateness of the technology in, in the country. And we have to also set measurable goals. When we, we, we set up all these you know, infrastructure expansions and so on, we really have adhered to, to the goals, to the standards we have set for ourselves. And with MHELs, you know, we have to really come up with goals that are linked with the health service outcomes, and we really need to know what we are going to purchase when we invest in, in, in M health solutions. I think I have taken a lot of time. I probably wind up here. Thank you for uh, listening to me. Thank you very much. <laughs>